thank you and thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for listening there's been a you know you'll be very patient listening to us this morning and hopefully we'll have some time for questions afterwards um so i work for nhs resolution um for those of you who don't know what nhs resolution is um, it used to be known as the NHS Litigation Authority, so some of you may be more familiar with that term. Um, and we, we rebranded and changed our name in 2017. Um, and these are the four functions that sit within the organisation. So um, I'm, a, I'm assuming there's a lot of people from Trust here, um, so all of you hopefully be familiar with the Clinical Negligence Scheme. So it's a not-for-profit, shared, um, pooled approach to collect in from all of the organisations in the CNST membership, the amount of money we expect to pay out on a given year is collected from all of you. Um, it's a huge amount of money. I think, as you've heard from Secretary of State, we're looking at 2.2 billion next year. Um, and so my role, particularly in safety learning, is to do absolutely everything we can do to prevent some of the harm that we're seeing and to help reduce some of that cost. Within the organisation, we also have Practitioner Performance Advice, previously known as NCAS, who are supporting practitioners in difficulty. We have Primary Care Appeals Unit, which is around um, looking at appeals for performance lists. And as I said, we have the Safety and Learning Team. Um, so just a bit about the scale of the problem that we're facing. So the volume of clinical negligence um, continues to... to um, be presented and we are seeing a slight change now in some of the categories. Um, for the first time this year, we've seen um, the number of claims in accident and emergency have gone above those in orthopaedic surgery. We think that's probably maybe linked to the, the, the volume of activity, but we are going to be doing some specific work to kind of look at those claims in detail and I'll come back to that. And you can see the breakdown there of the, the volume of the claims. However, the value of the claims, although if I go back to the, the volume, if you look at obstetrics, you know, whilst it is quite a small volume of the claims in terms of the value of a claim for in obstetrics for brain injury is in, in excess of now £20 million per case. So it's a huge amount of cost to the system and a huge amount of human cost to the, the individuals. And I'll talk more about that. Um, can I just have a show of hands in the room? Have any of you seen these claim scorecards in your organisation? Just a, oh, there's a, there's a few hands up, which is very encouraging. Um, so part of our role in safety and learning is to try and get organisations to have much more awareness of the claims that um, they are receiving. Um, we have a claims management system within the organisation which is actually almost 100% patient-generated. So it's not clinically reported that these are events that have happened across the NHS. Um, and so we give back the data to every organisation in membership of the, the claims that we've had that have happened in the last 10 years, so from point of incident, and to be broken down by specialty. So they go to your heads of claims, your chief execs, medical and nurse directors, um, they are password protected within your organisation because they do eventually claim have some identifiable data. But please talk to people within your organisations to have a look at it by specialty because it's incredibly powerful information to be looking at. Um, it's also, we're working in partnership, I think you heard earlier people talking about the Get It Right First Time, the GERFT work, um, who are also drawing attention to the amount of money that is kind of within specialty by claims. We're quite often asked about benchmarking as well, and they're doing benchmarking by specialty. Um, but what we're really trying to do is get conversations about claims in the same space that currently conversations are being held about complaints and incidents, because nearly always the contributing factors are the same. And the reason we've gone for a 10-year point of incident tool is because in the past, when we talked to people about claims, they said, oh, well, that happened years ago. Now these are far more current. Um, so I would um, kind of urge you to have a look at those. Um, they are categorised by specialty and by cost. So there's over three of the over a million pound claims. They'll sit in the red and you can see the, the variation around, you know, the, the volume versus the value claims. Um, Part of our role in the change of our branding is to try and get more upstream. I think you've seen very similar 
in some of the arms, other arms length bodies where we in the past used to really not know about an incident that had occurred until we received a letter of claim. We're trying to look into those claims in far more detail so that we can help organisations to understand some of the contributing factors and do some work on preventing those claims. We're also, when we do receive a, a claim, trying to act on those far more quickly, offering mediation and trying to resolve those so that people don't have very long drawn out waits for compensation. We've got a particular scheme at the moment for maternity. If anyone wants to know a bit more about that, um, do ask about early notification. We also do some work around inquests. That's the team. It's a very small team. In fact, one of our team members is here. I think Justin is here. You put your hands up. He's our London region rep. Um, so we are a very small team for, for England. Um, we have people um, that manage each region, so one per region, so that's an awful lot of trust to cover. Um, but what we're really focusing on is what our added value might be to the system around bringing attention to the, the claims data and how we can work with other arm's length bodies in terms of helping organisations and share resources. We run a number of events and what we try very hard to do is not stand here and tell people how to do any of this, but we try and get the trust where they've got the best practice to share with each other. And we've had a number of very successful events where that has happened. So this kind of headline um, is something that you know is hugely concerning. When I first started in the organisation, a very young man who was sort of in his mid-twenties came to see me and he had very recently had a baby. Um, gone into labour with his, into labour ward with his wife, um, extremely excited, and unfortunately, the baby um, had brain injury. And the reason he came to see me um, was, in fact, in this case, liability had been admitted very early. Was he said that he'd been to every organisation, including the trust um, and the CQC, the CCG. He'd been to actually have a meeting with the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister. And he said he hadn't yet found the person or the organisation he could talk to who was responsible for making sure somebody learnt from what happened to his son. Um, and the answer, of course, to that is it's everyone's job, you know, and I think we have to work collectively to do whatever we can is to share those messages and hear what his experience was like and how we can improve. So where do we start? So the previous Secretary of State... Um, gave the ambition of um, the NHS to be the largest um, learning organisation in the world. We just heard something very similar from our current Secretary of State. Um, so what does it mean? Um, in my spare time, I've been studying for a PhD, I've nearly finished, and I've been very interested in how the organisational principles of learning organisations are really understood, and how learning organisations theory links to the well-led concept. So I've been doing a case study in the trust that has been assessed as well led to find out from the staff what does well led feel like to you and how does that link to learning organisation principles and I come back to a little bit about what good looks like in this organisation because the first thing that's very obvious in the trust that I've been working with is the consistency no matter who I spoke to they said very similar things so it was um, a very kind of it's quite a powerful thing to hear is particularly in the culture of no blame, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but also in the way that they were very supportive of each other as colleagues in that organisation. So part of our um, work is very much about partnership with families. Um, we try and work with families. Whenever we have events, we get the families to speak and share their experiences. And particularly, we have a, a lot of work going on about supporting staff. So when we talk to families, without exception, regardless of the level of harm, this is what they all say. Um, and without any exception, even if they are due a very fair large amount of compensation, their starting point of what they're looking for is someone to say sorry. And that is very much NHS Resolutions policy. It is always the right thing to do to say sorry. And real apologies, not that I'm sorry you feel that way, but real genuine apologies about what's happened and a commitment to investigate. Um, they want to be heard, they want a fair, independent investigation to be involved, um, that to be compassionate and signposted to support where appropriate. We've recently commissioned some research which looked at some of our, our lower value claims and interestingly, very much the same messages were coming out. So 
What we don't want is a situation where people feel that the only way that they can get an answer is to make a claim. And often you hear that from some of the public, it was the only way I could get them to listen, was, was to follow that route. And in some cases, actually, patients have been directed by the NHS to do just that. You know, so if people are due fair compensation, that's absolutely the right process. But you know, not to get an answer and to find out what's happened to them. We need them to be able to have honest and open conversations with, with the organisations. So what do staff expect is exactly the same. When we talk to the staff, they also want compassion, understanding and support when they've been involved in clinical incidents, when at any kind of incident, um, and they often are not given the opportunity to apologise themselves. They're often part of some kind of investigation that goes on, but they're not integral to that and integral to meetings with the family. And also they need support for some of those family meetings and they need some training. Um, they also you know, want to make sure this ha doesn't happen to anyone else. And we often have, you know, staff that we've spoken to where they've been involved in serious incidents, some of them have never practised again. You know, it's been such a devastating experience for them and the support around them has not been there. You know, so it's very important to see families and staff in the same space because actually we're all in, on the same side. We're not adversarial of each other. We are there to just give the best care that we can do. So in supporting staff is huge piece of our work and our belief is if you give your staff the best support they'll give the best possible patient care. So just a little bit about the difference between blame and accountability. Um, as I said I've been doing quite a lot of um, studying and you can find all kinds of um, interesting theories about the difference between blame and accountability. This is just something that's very easily googled on the internet and I think it's a simple explanation about what the difference is. So this is some work by Rick, Rick Bremer who is talking about the difference is, is that when you talk about blame, you're really talking about being blameable and punishment. When you're talking about accountability, you're talking about people being able to be answerable to what went on and to be part of the finding the solution to that. Um, and the difference is there's four dimensions there. But if punishment's the goal, um, then, you know, you're going to have a blame culture. So if people talk about um, finding the culprit, you know, then you've got a blaming culture. There's some interesting slides here for another day, really, that Suzette Woodward has looked at, um, which is around the... If you actually start to explore some of the clinical incidents that get reported, um, if people are just reporting things about processes or equipment they usually it's a sort of indicative of a, of a blaming culture because they're not really actually talking about reporting that you know their, their system failures and talking about it in a more open way they're just reporting things that feel safe to report um, very interesting study that she, she's done into that if people are fearful then that's a strong incident of blaming um, and often you find um, wherever you are in an organizational chart that um, you know there are many occasions where those people that are accountable for the system in which staff operate are not the people that are being um, in, in that category where they may feel that there is blame. Um, and if you really want to sort of find people that if you look at a system versus a person um, a process around accountability you'd have a very long list of people. I can recall very long time ago when I was a director of nursing looking into a very serious incident and by the time we'd finished investigating we had about 15 individuals that were part of a very serious incident and all of those it was a sort of chain event of things that had happened due to the, the set of circumstances on that day. How many of you have seen this? A show of hands, anyone seen this? So this is just one tool, and there are many tools. And in fact, NHS Improvement have just recently um, reviewed and issued a, a, a revised version of this. This is the James Reason tool. Um, there are some organisations like Mersey Care we've been working with who don't use these kind of tools at all. They look at the kind of DECA work and restorative culture work. But it is a helpful thing to look at in terms of the how when people are involved in an incident. And just to give you an example, we I heard earlier about um, never events, or if you, if you looked at something like a retained swab or a drug error. And the way to use this, which is quite a helpful way of, of at least taking a consistent approach to um, incidents that occur, is to ask some of these questions, um, and particularly to collectively together with a team when you start your investigation. It's first of all is, so if you've got a drug error, 
or you've got a wrong site surgery, or you've got a, a retained swab, you know, was the action intended? 99 times out of 100, the answer is absolutely going to be no. Um, and then the second question is, was the individual um, that was involved in that case, had they got a medical condition, had they, were they drunk, had they been taking some kind of drug? Um, and, you know, hopefully the answer is going to then be no. The next question you would ask is um, whether you feel that that person has knowingly deviated from a safe operating procedure. Um, can I just ask you in the room, um, how many of you have ever written down your IT password? So that's kind of what people do. I suspect wherever you work, you've got a policy that says you mustn't do that. Um, so what people do is they do workarounds. So, and that becomes the norm. So if a policy is not working for somebody, they will find a way around it. And then when people start to normalize the way around it, you start to find that people are not following safe operating procedures. Another really common example is two members of staff witnessing a controlled drug administration. You know, a bit of a signature in the book, run to the patient, and not going with them. Um, unfortunately, you know, people are short-staffed and they do workarounds, and that's when you start to get errors. Um, the other question is, are the procedures workable? You know, do they actually work for people? Are people that are involved in frontline involved in those policies and procedures development? The next question you'd ask, well, if this had occurred on this particular day, would another member of staff of the same level, with the same staffing levels, with the same level of experience and training, would the same error have occurred? And if you've got, uh, the answer is yes to that question, you know that you are really moving into a system issue here. And then the fourth one is really, does that individual have a history of safe acts? You may be in a, a capability issue. Um, you may be in um, sort of an area of, of training and competency. But the most important thing, if I was writing this chart today, I'd have another box that said, and what did you do at the point that an error occurred? So what I find that families and patients are very forgiving. If people are open and honest and they acknowledge their mistakes, what they won't forgive is cover up you know, people not reporting incidents and, and not seeking the help that they need. So it's just one tool. As I said, there's another tool that's been recently reviewed. Um, the, the, the Americans, of course, have a, something similar, but they've got a kind of just a quick question to think about. Um, the criticisms of those tools are the sort of work that's going on in Mersey Care. So have a look if any of you have followed Twitter at the work going on in Mersey Care um, and they're sort of resistant to using those kind of, of um, tools. Um, I think what we would say is what we really want to do is promote a consistent, systematic approach to looking at investigations and incidents, so organisations are at different places. Um, this is a, another slide from my colleague Suzette, and I think it's a really helpful slide around what does a just culture look like. Um, and, you know, it just talks about the different types of error that occur. So we talked about human error, we talked about risky behaviours and choices. We talk about reckless behaviour and, and what we might do with those. And then we talk about the criminal harm. And the bulk of the issues that we see are really sitting in the first category, you know, errors and how do we manage that? Um, what we do know is that if human error is coupled with harm to a patient and condemnation and disciplinary action, you're much more likely to have an unsafe culture. Um, I've done quite a lot of work over the years with never events. I think beware the organisation that has not been reporting never events. It doesn't mean they haven't got them. It's about the reporting that's gone on. Um, and so it's absolutely um, important that people are not fearful of speaking up. Um, we know that disciplining employees um, for honest mistakes does little to improve safety. We, we are about to release some guidance that we've been working on, which is around the inequities around staff and disciplinaries across the whole of England. We've been working with Roger Klein on that. Um, and what you can see is huge variation between organisations and the need to have a much more consistent approach. Um, and the work on Mersey Care, which I would highly recommend, has just shown how they've turned that around significantly. Um, Suspending staff is, you know, hugely stressful for members of staff, but it's also extremely expensive to the system, um, and it's something that, you know, I think should be the absolute exception, not the norm, and you'll see if you look around the country some real huge variations in that. 
Um, just some, to finish, just some of the work we're currently doing. So, as I said, we just appointed a clinical fellow and we are tending to appoint um, clinical fellows on an annual basis. Last year, we had a report from Alice Oates that you might have seen, which is about um, claims related to suicide in mental health care services. Um, the year before, Michael Madro on five years learning of claims in cerebral palsy. Um, this year, we're going to be focusing on um, claims in emergency care, as I said, that have, have the volume of which have increased. We've, we're doing some work with our expert witnesses around feeding back some of the kind of avoidable factors that they're seeing when they're reviewing some of the claims. And then we have a whole range of pieces of work that we're doing, which we call the Faculty of Learning, it's some modules on tools and resources to help all of you. Um, and if you want to know anything more about any of these, please have a look on our website and we can direct you to some of the resources that we are using. Um, those, as I said, just some of our publications there. They're all on our website. Please have a look at those. Um, and as I said, there are, you know, probably our most popular leaflet is the saying, sorry leaflet. I think what's helpful is that it sort of talks a little bit about the how. And I think just to finish, um, I'll go back to sort of some of the lessons I've learned from what does well-led look like. Um, in the organisation that I've been studying, um, without exception, there's nobody I spoke to who didn't say anything different around the way in which they were supported when they're involved in incidents. What this organisation is very tough on is poor behaviour, rudeness, incivility, um, and actually some of the things we heard earlier about failure to agree to follow the, the checklist. You know, they've got staff that are you know, voicing that. They take that very, very strongly. The other thing I found, just as an aside, is an interesting view about hierarchy. Um, and I would sort of challenge some of those views about hierarchy. The organisation had mixed views about it. Um, they wanted staff to be accessible. They wanted the senior team to be accessible. They wanted informality. They wanted to be able to talk and speak. But at the same time, they did want a degree of hierarchy structure, which helped them feel safe. So my kind of challenge to some of that debate about hierarchies it's about hierarchical behaviors and i think that's the bit that we need to to take some um work forward on so thank you for listening thank you <laughs>